Good morning. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Evan Frey, and I'm with the marketing department of ADRA New Zealand, which is, has been described as being the best kept secret of the Adventist church. And it is my job to make sure that that myth is totally knocked over over the next few years. And I'd also like to thank Sherelle for doing that children's story about the lost sheep. I think that was terrific. Now, just to introduce Sherelle, Sherelle is, um, she's the girl that organises um, the, the, hands up anyone that's heard of the Mission Bay fun run that we have down in Auckland, where that's why it's pretty popular events, raised a lot of money for ADRA. It's really raised our profile amongst people, um, and it's importantly raised funds for our organisation. Well, Sherelle is the girl that coordinates all of that sort of thing, and it's her job to get um, events like that happening throughout, throughout the whole country. So if anybody has a good idea, and I know that Sherelle is always receptive to good ideas as far as how we can organise social happenings, whether it be a run, a walk, a swim, a bicycle ride, a canoe, a mountain climb, whatever, make sure you talk to Sherelle because she would be very keen on, on listening to you. So as part of the marketing of ADRA and as part of um, dispelling this myth about us being the best kept secret, what, what I'd really like to do is to sort of um, answer the, the, the questions that we get or the questions that I've had are why when we have some sort of disaster where we have things going on, we see other organisations there doing their bit, especially in this country, they're doing their bit, we don't see ADRA, we don't see ADRA in the newspaper, we don't see ADRA on the TV. Well, the thing is they don't pay me enough. That's the answer. <laughs> we don't have that sort of marketing department. We don't have people that are full-time. As soon as there's an emergency overseas, there are organisations. The thing is, get there quick, get there first, get your flag up, get your banner up, and then get on TV, get in the newspaper. We don't do it that way. We do development work. ADRA, Adventist Development Relief Agency. Development work. So some people aren't too sure just what development work means. Um, just as a simple, in a nutshell, if uh, there are organisations overseas that go around and they rescue um, babies that are dumped, abandoned, left at the rubbish tip, whatever, and they do a great work, they find uh, foster homes for these babies, and, and they do a fantastic job. Our job in development is we are to make sure the babies don't get in the rubbish tip. So that's why we do um, finance things, we do animal banks, we do cow banks, we do goat banks, we do all sorts of medical initiatives, we do lots of stuff like that. Not always newsworthy worthy stuff. Um, a few weeks ago, Barbara and I, my wife Barbara and I, we were in Vietnam, um, I don't know how to put this delicately, but we were looking at latrines, soil, sanitation, clean water, things like that. We're looking at things that aren't the nicest things that wouldn't get you on the front page of the newspaper, but if you're living in a, in a dirt floor room with your family, you want to have clean water. These are initiatives, well drilling and stuff like that. So that's the sort of thing that ADRA gets involved with. Um, I'm hoping this little unit here will work. What we have, it worked. There's a well-recognised brand name. Now, it's well-known, it's famous and all the rest of it. And why is it famous? It's because somebody had a vision. And during World War II, Coca-Cola got on the map by saying, no matter what it costs a company, we're going to make sure that every fighting man overseas has a drink of Coca-Cola for five cents. It may cost us 50 cents or a dollar to make, but that's our contribution. That was their branding of that product. As a result of that vision that they had, they've got themselves a marketable thing. Now, our church, we own this brand. Now, that's our brand. That's the, the people holding hands around the globe. It's whatever you see and look into that picture. Now, to make that successful, we have, speak to me, we have a vision. Now there's our vision there, and it says, this is the vision of ADRA International. We have different um, offices all over the world. ADRA International is basically ADRA America. Um, we have ADRA New Zealand, 
America, New Zealand, Denmark, Germany, countries like that, we're what they call a donor office. We're not an implementing office. So we raise funds for projects that countries like uh, the Solomon Islands, like Papua New Guinea, any of the Pacific Islands, um, Somalia and places like that where they have nothing and they have a huge need, they are an implementing office. So those implementing offices can only work if ADRA New Zealand or countries, donor offices like ADRA New Zealand, like America, like Denmark, like Germany, get together and embrace their projects, raise the funds and get the, get the projects going. So we have this, um, yeah, okay, so the, we're a professional, learning and efficient network that embodies integrity and transparency. ADRA reaches across boundaries, empowering and speaking out for the at-risk and forgotten to achieve measurable, documented, durable changes in lives and society. They're great words, you know, but in actual fact it's true. You know, we try really hard to do all these sort of things. Now, in the course of doing those sort of things, we can get a bit stuck, we can get a bit bogged down. Sometimes we need help. Now, these, these are pictures, some of these pictures I've got from the internet, but some of these I got from a, uh, a conference we went to in Thailand where we had a big meeting of all the ADRA um, headquarter heads of department and different things. It was great. So sometimes we need a bit of help. Sometimes we need a lot of help. And sometimes we see things that we don't really want to see. You know, we see the floods, we see the earthquakes, we see tsunamis, we see tent cities with people in it that, that are really suffering. And that's when we, our emergency management section kicks in. Now, we're fortunate that we do have a very good emergency management system. Not necessary that in New Zealand where there was an emergency and you don't see ADRA, sure we have our, you know, if we're on the spot and we've got a church that's very active with an ADRA department, they will get stuck in and they will do things, but we're very fortunate that we do live in a society and in a country that has things like civil defence, like a fire service, um, like, you know, an ambulance service and stuff like that. So, uh, but where we get involved, we get involved with countries where those sort of things don't exist. So when you see situations like that, um, some of it's not pleasant to see. And sometimes even getting to situations like this, on your way there you see things that aren't pleasant to see either. So you can just imagine, they've flown on some dodgy airlines where you look out the window and see that the, uh, the engine cover's missing, and all you can do is think, the sooner I get to the ground, the better. But even that can have its problems. And some of them are quite small problems and some of them can be quite large problems. But however, getting there and back and all the rest of it, that's not important. We're really going there to see the people. Now, some of these people that we go to see, they're not that keen, they're not that pleasant, they're not that helpful. In fact, in one of the security um, things, you know, even these are the adults, but sometimes the children are even worse. Now, we're fortunate we don't live in those situations and we don't get to experience it. One of the security um, courses that I was on, a good suggestion that came out of it, that when you get into some of these countries, always have a pocket full of small change, small coins. Because if you bump into some of these children, it can be advisable to throw a handful of coins that way, and that'll give you a couple of minutes start that way, and you can get out of it. So always you've got to be on your, on your guard. Sometimes the paths we travel are narrow and steep. And sometimes the roads that we travel are also narrow and steep. And sometimes you have to build your own road. So, not that we get into road construction, but however, has anybody seen these bridges before? These were bridges in Myanmar, were built by um, ADRA, basically by ADRA, after the tsunami. And they were a series of, I've got a cutting here that I'm going to read from, the, a series of bridges, there was about 22 bridges. Has anybody seen the photos of these bridges? There was a story in the record, uh, May 2008. But anyway, these, these are ADRA bridges, and the local people, they complained. After their bridges and everything had been wiped away, we built these bridges, and they were steep, and the wooden ramps got a bit slippery and all that, and the, and the, the local people, they weren't that happy. But however, in uh, 
2008, Cyclone Nargis hit the place and there was extreme flooding. And these series of bridges saved nearly 900 people because they were the only things in the landscape above water. And people clung to those bridges for days. I'll just read a little bit about it. The bridges were built as part of a three-year tsunami rehabilitation project that was being implemented by ADRA office in Myanmar following the devastation of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, so we did all that sort of stuff. But during the, during the Cyclone Nargis, uh, where nearly 900 people were saved, people stood on the bridge and were saved because the bridge was the highest point during the tidal waves and subsequent flooding. So, you know, now those bridges are, they're, they're staying. There's no, there's no complaints about them. They're, they're one, of, one of the finest things in the country. They were well built and they withstood everything. Um, Right, so if we go back to the roads, the roads are constructed, and once you get a road, everybody wants to use it. So you can imagine some of the travel around some of these countries can get a little bit, a uh, little bit heart in the mouth, but what about that? How would you like that? So just on a light-hearted look, ADRA people, well, we feel a bit overloaded from time to time. And there are times when we have to use our initiative. We really have to use our initiative. <laughs> and sometimes we have to use someone else with a lot of initiative. <laughs> and sometimes the initiative of the locals is just amazing. You know, how would you like to fit air conditioning into your um, vehicle? I'm sorry, I forgot to ask the sound man. Have we got sound on this thing? Can we get sound? Can you plug sound into that computer? Please, tell me you can. So, um, yeah, just some of the things that you see are just absolutely amazing. Yeah, I should have told you we've got a video clip and I'd like to get the sound going on it if we've... Uh, I can babble on for another half hour or so anyway, but we can come back to it. <laughs> and there are times when all we want to do is we just don't want to clash. <laughs> but uh, there's, always, there's always something going on. Um, and then the hardest part of the whole thing is to make our, our, our books balance. So sometimes when, in the course of balancing our books, uh, can we push play or something on this video clip and get some... We have a slight technical problem here. I should have... Uh, down the bottom left-hand corner of that screen screen as a, an icon yep, in there somewhere, just up a bit. Anyway, just, um, just <laughs> this is sort of a, a little bit key to what I want to say, so um, we can skip it if it's too much of a hassle, guys. I'll tell you what, maybe we can play that later on, later on this afternoon, we can play that one. I'll just flick over it. So just pull the sound cords out. So, whoop. Just go back. So what we really want to do is we want to just melt into the background. You want to just blend in. That's always the easiest way to do things. And talking about blending in, now what, what I'd like to do is just go from our ADRA clip into open up your, your Bibles and we can... We can um, have a look at something else which is sort of linked on to the blending in. So before we do that, we'll just have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to present what ADRA does, to present to this church. We pray for faith that we can uh, believe in our organisations. We also invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now as we move into looking at your word. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Right. Blending in. We're talking about uh, societies blending into each other. Here we've got a map of Israel. Now, today we're going to be looking at a lot of Second Kings and things like that, just to have a look to see what what happened to Israel in the Babylonian time. It's a it's a section of um, 
of history that interests me. We had Israel that was divided into north and south. It was basically the 12 tribes of Israel. They split Israel in the middle and in the north. Um, Ten of the tribes took over and the um, north was known as Israel. It was also known as Ephraim and it was also known as Samaria. Where in the bottom, the, the families of Judah and Benjamin took over the southern kingdom and that was um, known as uh, Judah, was also known as Jerusalem, was also known as Zion. So... The south actually lasted about 130 years longer than the north because the north was unbelievably corrupt with their kings. The south, um, they had some good kings, but they had an unbelievably amount of um, bad kings as well. And throughout the rule of, of these kings, you know, there was, I'll, I'll just give a bit of a background before we get into it. We, we've got the situation where the prophets are prophesying and they're saying to the kings, smarten up. This is going to come to an end. There's going to be captivity. There's, you know, all sorts of uh, doom was predicted for the, for the, um, the, the kingdom of Judah if it didn't didn't pull its socks up. And then God decided that, you know, He had said to save my people, I will send you into captivity. And I've always sort of worried, you know, wondered about, you know, okay, we're going to save the people by sending them into captivity. Um, so we look at a bit of the history of some of these kings. And one of the best kings, if we look at 2 Kings 18, verse 3, we read about Hezekiah. Now Hezekiah was one of the better kings of the south. Um, he, had, he had married uh, the daughter of Isaiah. He was a, a man of God. And he carried on, and you can see in there where the things that he did, he did that was right in the sight of the Lord, um, and, and you can see what he did in, in uh, verse 4 there where he took down the images that had been set up and, and all that sort of stuff and he, he trusted God. He was, he was a, a really good king. Now, his, he was replaced by, if you look at 2 Kings uh, 21, 11, Manasseh was the next one along. Now, as good as Hezekiah was, Manasseh was bad. I mean, he was, he was unbelievably wicked. He... He actually um, put Isaiah to death. You know, that was his own grandfather. I mean, this, this guy was a, um, you know, he, he was the, the beginning of the worst lot, really. So you can read in there that what he did, you know, um, that God had said, I am going to uh, put you into the, into the house of your enemies. And if... Also, in 2 Kings 23, 35, this is where we sort of get, start to, to get into um, where the threats are starting to come in, where why were they so bad? You know, and you've got here that uh, Jeho Jehoiakim at this stage, you know, he was giving the gold and silver of his people. He was giving it according to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh was calling the tunes on Jehoiakim. Pharaoh was taxing them, and Jehoiakim was quite openly paying Pharaoh's, um, filling his coffers for his money. So money from Judah was going to Pharaoh. Now this was, obviously, we still had prophets that were saying, we have to repent, we have to sort this out and get it right. So there was a section of Judah at that time that were living the word. There was also the leadership at the time that were totally corrupt, that were taking the money from one and giving it, uh, to the other, and if you look at verse seven, it says, "And he did." This is on uh, uh, twenty-three, verse thirty-seven. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So, what happens? God then decides he's had enough. And if you look at uh, stay with it on that same page in verse twenty-four, Second Kings twenty-four one, where you see that Nebuchadnezzar. He is the king of Babylon, and he comes up and he takes on um, Jehoiakim, who becomes, in my Bible, it says a vassal or a servant. So what happens historically, we've got Nebuchadnezzar, be, uh, when, because there was an alliance between Egypt, there was also an alliance between Egypt and Judah, Babylon at the time was becoming quite a strong power in the land and they considered that the threat of Judah and Egypt together would be a threat to their society. 
So Nebuchadnezzar, who at this stage wasn't actually the prince of Babylon, he was the prince of Babylon, he wasn't the king, he took off to Egypt and he had a, f- a fight. They had a war with Egypt at a place called Carchemish, and he inflicted quite a, a big um, victory over the Egyptians. So he'd sort of subdued the Egyptians. He'd broken that alliance between Egypt and Judah. So then, when he came back to Babylon, he called into Judah, and it, that was the time when he first became a king, because his father had died. He then became, he was King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, called into Judah, lined up the hierarchy of uh, Jehoiakim and his, um, the leadership, and he said, you are now my servant. So at that stage... Um, this is where this, in 24.1, where it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal, or his servant. So here is the time when in, that in Jewish history, um, speak. What happened there? We've lost something. Okay. In a timeline, we'd be talking about 605 BC. So in 605 BC, we've got Nebuchadnezzar coming into Judah and saying, you are now my servant. Now, this is a critical thing. It's at that point in the Jewish history that they refer to it as what they call the first deportation. Now, that's the time when, uh, when Daniel and his friends were sent from Judah to live in Babylon. So I'm thinking to myself, well, okay... We've got this corrupted king who's just been told that his uh, allegiance with the pharaoh is over and he's got to send, he's been told by Nebuchadnezzar, we're taking five or 10,000 of your people back to Babylon to assimilate them into Babylonian society. This is how they worked. So I would imagine that the ones that Jehoiakim would have wanted to get rid of was probably the good, the people that were against him. Those that were against him were for God. So he would have encouraged the people to be deported would be what he would consider as troublemakers to his kingdom. So I would imagine that that's why Daniel and his family and his friends were sent from um, Jerusalem to go into Babylonian society. Now we've got... A blank screen. Now we've got an interesting situation here. This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So if we're talking about 605 being the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign and the first year of deportation, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. The key point is in the second year. So we're now we're just flicking into Daniel. So in Daniel 2, we see Nebuchadnezzar having his dream. Traditionally, I've always understood the story of Daniel. You can imagine we told our children, we told our grandchildren, all this sort of thing, where Daniel is deported to Babylon. He's a slave boy in Babylon. He's in chains, and he's selected to be, by the king to be part of this uh, supergroup situation. He goes through the dietary tests and things like that. But here we're starting to get a bit of a different picture because we've, we see that in the first year of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign... He takes the captives, including Babylon, back to, uh, including Daniel, back to Babylon. In the second year of his reign, he has a dream, and it's a pretty powerful dream. His spirits were so troubled that sleep left him. Okay, so and then he commands his astrologers and magicians to sorcerers, and these are the Chaldeans. These are people that he had assimilated into his society years before, and he demands an explanation, but he doesn't get it. So, okay, so we've got the first year of his reign, he's stamped his authority on Judah. The second year of his reign, he's now back in Babylon, and he's having this dream. Um, and I start to think, well, okay, so what happened? Did, did, Babylon act- did uh, Daniel actually get called back to Babylon, get locked up in chains and all the rest of it? And I took a couple of um, passages out of a, a Jewish history book by a rabbi called Ken Spiro. Now, this guy was saying that there's two Talmuds. Now, this is the, uh, the, the first time that they'd actually started to write down their laws. As, as the um, people of Israel were living in Jerusalem, they were under this constant threat of attack from all sorts of people. The kingdom in the north had been taken over by Assyria. 
the southern kingdom knew it was going to be attacked. They knew it was predicted, God's word was told to them by the prophets, that they would be attacked. So then they decided they would start to write down their laws, write down their rules. So in, while they were in Jerusalem, under this threat of attack, they wrote down their, their, their Talmud. So it says here that the rabbis of Babylon also were writing down their, their Talmud as well. The rabbis of Babylon had access to the Jerusalem Talmud while they were working on their text. But if there is a dispute between the two Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmud is followed because the Babylonian Talmud is considered more authoritative and the Jerusalem Talmud is more difficult to study. The Jewish students poring over the Talmud are chiefly using the Babylonian Talmud. Okay, we'll just go to the next slide. This is it from the same book. And it says the Jerusalem Talmud is much shorter. It contains only four of the six sections of the Mishnah. Now that's the uh, written version of their oral traditions. And it is more cryptic and harder to understand than the Babylonian Talmud. The situation of the Jews in Babylon was much more stable and the rabbis in Babylon had considerably more time to edit and explain the subject matter. So what's that doing us now to the situation where Daniel has been brought back into Babylon and they've still got rabbis, they've still got a process where they can record their traditions. We know that he stuck to his dietary law so we're getting a different picture of the, the view of the life of young Daniel. Let's say he was 12 when he left um, Judah or left Jerusalem in 605. By the time he's now in Babylon, where they're, they've got a, a, a well-established Jewish society, which obviously were very dedicated people, which makes me reinforce the idea that I've got that uh, when they left Babylon, the people that left were actually the, the, the pick of the crop. So here we've got Daniel and his friends and his family and their society living as Jews in Babylon, which was the idea of the Babylonian people, to assimilate them in. They keep their customs. They're obviously keeping their rabbis. They're keeping their traditions, and they're keeping their books. Not only keeping their books, they're expanding their religion. So then we, when we read that earlier package, where, a passage where... Um, Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years, then he turned. That just means that he then, uh, the Babylonians had a rematch with the Egyptians, and it was a bit of a draw. Nobody really won. But Jehoiakim, back in Jerusalem, realigned himself with the pharaohs again. So at this stage, um, Nebuchadnezzar has probably had enough. So here we've got in 2 Kings 24, probably... Leave, we can leave the Bible open on that page for a little while because in 2 Kings 24 it says, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim came as servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled. So Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord, the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees, Syrians, Moabites, children of Ammon, and they went against Judah to destroy it. These are all the allies of Nebuchadnezzar living in Babylon. He sends his allies out to do the siege, to do the dirty work. So how long does the siege last? We can stay in 2 Kings 24, 11. This is, and then the king of Babylon came against the city and his, uh, his servants were besieging it. So here we've got the first time that Jerusalem is actually under siege. The first time it was just a matter of calling in and making him his servant and taking the captives. The second time was a siege. When was that? Key point at the end, the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. So here you've got this situation. Um, this time it'll work. No, there's something happening with our, with our timelines seem to have got lost off that. Don't worry about it. So the timelines, uh, we've got 605, we've got our first deportation. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Here it's now the eighth year of his reign. So eight, year late, eight years later, we've got him coming down and actually forming a siege, which is surrounding the city, starving them out, letting the um, starvation, letting the sickness take over. You've just got to hold out constantly, you know, I don't know, keep throwing rocks on their roof or something like that, keep them awake, deprive them of the necessities of life, 
So we've got Nebuchadnezzar now coming down for the end of the siege. Maybe, maybe the siege started two years earlier, but in the eighth year of his reign, he, he took it. He took the city. And it's at that point that um, the second lot of captives come now back from um, Jerusalem back to Babylon. So we've now got the second deportation. Now these people are beaten. They are, they've been under attack for year, a year, maybe years. They now come back. They are totally a beaten people. They come back to what to Babylon to what they expect to be total slavery and all the rest of it. And what do they find? Well, we've got the promise from God in Leviticus that no matter what happens to his people, God will be with them. Well, he was definitely with them when this lot came back to Babylon because they find that Daniel and his friends, and Daniel by this stage is sort of in his 20s, but as a typical member of society, he's well integrated into the society of Babylon. So here we've got an active, living, rabbi-ruled uh, um, people keeping God's word as it should be and the second lot of people come back from deportation as a rag tad mob they come in and there's the kosher food shops there's, there's, their society is there so God has made provision for all of that So, and it's at that point that as part of the uh, control of Jerusalem because when they sieged the place they set up their own puppet king who was another no hoper they set him up, brought the people back into Babylon, and they've now got the situation here where the king instructs his servants to get Daniel into... Well, he instructs them. There's some key things in here. He says, I want you to pick out some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, some of the nobles. Now, he specifies what he wants. And you'll see there it's, he wants young men. Sorry, ladies. He wants young men in whom there was no blemish, good-looking, Gifted in wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, um, so that they had ability to serve the king. So you've got to picture this. It's not, he's not picking children from the um, king's descendants, from the king of Israel. He's picking children from his own nobility. So the, the Nebuchadnezzar is saying, right, we're going to sort this out once and for all. I want a group. I want the best of our society formed into a group. But he wants some of the children of Israel. Which children of Israel? The first lot or the second lot? He's going to be looking for good-looking ones. He's going to be looking for ones that they know can absorb education. He's going to be looking for the ones that, as is listed there. He's not going to take them from the lot that he's just been hold, had been held up in their city for, for uh, a year or two. He's going to take the ones that he knows. This is where Daniel is living. Daniel is living in society. That's why they chose Daniel, because they knew he had integrity, they knew he had intelligence. He'd worked with them for eight years, or as of now a young adult or a full-grown man, he's now reached a stage where Nebuchadnezzar's servants knew what they were getting. I'm hoping this will come up. No. Well, we've really lost out. Well, I've got a list of timelines as things happen, so we're just, I'm just going to have to keep going over it. Um, so we've got this timeline of 601 when uh, Babylon is taken. We've got now eight years later when it falls under siege. We've got a three-year trial period if we go... If we go... Uh, uh, okay, where are we? Nebuchadnezzar set a three-year trial period. You'll, you'll remember that if you go to Daniel, Daniel 1. This is, we can stay in Daniel for a while here. We're nearly finished. So in Daniel 1, you've got here um, Daniel 1, 3. So he instructed the, the, his servants to find all these, the right type of person. Uh, five, six, seven, seven. Now in 5, it says the king appointed them the food and all that, and he set a time that they would have... Three years. So in Daniel 1, 5, it's got, and the king appointed a daily portion of the king's delicacies, wine which he drank, and three years of training for them. So at the end of the time, they might serve before the king. So now we know what happened. Daniel said, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And at the end of the time, when the king tested him, he was better than all the others. 
Now, it's about after that three-year period that um, Daniel explains the dream. But I've, I'm just, uh, just going to flick forward a fl slide here. So we were told that it was going to be a... Um, that the time of captivity would be limited to 70 years. I think my friends down the back there have been monkeying with my... Uh, PowerPoint, <laughs> because there's some bits left off here. Okay. Let's just throw it away. So, <clears throat> moving on. So, we end up with this three-year period. So, now um, Daniel explains the dream. And I've sort of given you a bit of a hint as to why uh, Nebuchadnezzar would not choose from the people of children of Israel when he brought them out after the siege. Because if we understood a siege properly, properly um, if we go to Lamentations chapter 4, 4 to 5, there's not, there's not actually a, re a record of the, of the siege in... Um, of the second deportation, but there's a good one of the last time when finally the the last king was taken over. So in Lamentations, you might find it on that PowerPoint down there somewhere, but it's Lamentations 4 and in 5. This is a description of what happened after a two-year siege with the same... Um, people where Babylon finally went in and, and besieged the, the city of Jerusalem. The tongue of the infants clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. And jumping ahead to chapter 8, how are these people going to look after a two-year siege? Lamentations 4.8. Now their appearance is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones. It has become as dry as wood. And nine, those slain by the sword are better off. And those who die of hunger, for these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. In actual fact, we're pine away. Which I think that's the end of the sentence there, but it goes on, a, a com combination of nine and ten. Stricken for lacks of the fruit of the field, the hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them. So this is what people would, the depths that they would stoop to in a siege situation, which suggests to me that there's definitely no way that a, a king like Nebuchadnezzar would send his servants and say, out of that little lot, pick me somebody that's good looking and all the rest of it. So we're coming back to the reinforcement that Daniel has been selected because they knew him and he was part of the first siege. Now, the 70-year prediction, now I know that we've got that up there. We might have a go at finding that. We know that uh, God had predicted that the, um, siege, the um, tribulations would last for 70 years. Oh, it's arrived. That's what we just read about the results of the sieges. So in Jeremiah 29.10, you can see that he's saying after 70 years... I will visit you and perform my good work. So in other words, he's going to come back and take his people back after 70 years. The bottom there, I will bring you back from your captivity. And that's exactly what happened. And how it happened is another whole, there's a whole different story there. We know that Belshazzar had that, um, had the party. And Cyrus moved the river and came into the city and took it. Why did Belshazzar have the party? Belshazzar knew the 70 year prediction as well. He had the party because he had calculated the 70 year prediction had come and gone and he was out by one year. The party was, he was celebrating the fact that this prediction did not come true and that's when he finally got all the vessels out of the, the captive vessels from the temple and he was living it up and all the rest of it. And it was the same night that he fell. So here we've got God still in control. Even though these people are totally, you know, they're, 
they're still in captivity, but their society is still being kept intact, and now the 70 years is up, and they're going home. Not only that, when Cyrus does take over the place, he creates this edict, and he says that all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me. So he knew that he was part of the prediction, and he knew that God had given, had used him as an instrument to do his work. So he knew that he got success because of the Lord God. And so Cyrus then commands people to the, the Jewish people. He says, you can go home, you can build your temple, you can do all that sort of stuff. So Cyrus, or Cyrus, as the king, we know that he was, his arrival was predicted in Isaiah 45. And this is 200 years before Daniel. And there we've got it as plain as day. And thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, and then it's going to happen. So we're looking at, biblica, biblically, we're looking at a, um, a reinforcement of historical dates. And it's one of those things where when God decides that we're going to do something, that he's going to do something, we'd better listen. So just to finish off, if I go back to that map... When the Israelites returned to their land, they found a sort of a, a real mixture of people. Um, they had a sort of a similar religion, but it wasn't the same. But these people had been conquered by the Syrians and stuff. Now, I might have... No, okay. So they'd found that the people of the north were totally totally um, gone. You know, they, they had been completely uh, taken up by the, um, it was sort of Samaria, really, and the Samaritans, that's why they were sort of like always looked on as a, their religion was similar but not the same. They were sort of like, I don't know, a New Zealand-Australia relationship. They never quite got on, but it was one of those things where they lived in the same country, but they were definitely, there was the Jews and there was the Samaritans, and that was the, the basis of it, so... Yeah, but I thought, well, that was that's sort of a, a subject that interests me, and I thought, well, it was something where the key point that I got out of it was that I think for years I've been under misunderstandings about how Daniel has um, ended up in Babylon and what happened and how it happened, and historically we can it's all backed up. Um, I had timelines there of all dates and things that happened that sort of fell over on me, but however, I think you probably get the, the picture that that's the real story of, of Daniel, and those are the stories that when we're talking to people, particularly Jewish people and, um, and people of Islam, you know, they know these stories. They know, they know their Bible. They know their Bible history. And we are the sort of the keepers of the, you know, we believe in this Bible and we go out and we tell people that we believe in these stories. And I sort of like to get particularly the story of Daniel, get it right, because the second part of Daniel with our predictions and all the rest of it, um, the key point is if we're telling that particularly to Jewish people and they know we've got the first bit not quite right, they're never going to listen to the second bit. So it is, it is important in that respect. So, yeah. And I'd like to uh, maybe further invite this afternoon when we have a, if we're having a get-together, um, I can talk about um, projects that ADRA are doing both here and overseas. I can do that until you all get bored witless. But some of, the, you know, some of the stories are good. I've got some pictures, got some... DVDs that we can have a look at or whatever, we'll just see how it goes, but very much we would like to, um, to talk again this afternoon, but I guess I've gone over time. Um, how do you finish? Do we f you finish with a hymn or is it? It's a good hymn, have we? Okay. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace and freedom that you've given us in this country. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to read your Bible. We thank you for the education so that we can read the Bible and get an understanding from it. We thank you for the fact that today we are able to read and meet in peace. And we also listen to the words of those songs, you know, here am I, send me. What can I give? There are people there, Lord, that are crying out for help. We pray for ADRA. We pray for the administration. We pray for the church that governs ADRA. We pray for the people, the members of that church. We pray that they will see a need, that they will meet the need, and they will show compassion and generosity on the people that are less fortunate themselves. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.